You're watching The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG, an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original, non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. If you like what you see, please consider pledging to our Patreon to support the show and get access to a patron-only after-show, early podcast episodes, GM notes, character sheets, and even the chance for your tabletop OC to cameo in our series. Thank you so much for watching, and enjoy! The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for this episode include alcohol, fire, immolation, falling, sinking, death of loved ones, grief, trauma, complex and complicated relationships, fantasy violence, blood, gore, environmental collapse, pollution, and possession. Arc 1, Episode 18 a Burning Story From Self-Eulogy of a Martyr by Connie Chong The day Iphigenia dies. She is dancing. The first mate's promotion party, her best friend's promotion party, is in full swing. Glitterbug bunting is strung between masts, colorful ivy dangles from the manticrow's nest. Vosh is playing his lute and Umber is testing her new hand drum. The sun kisses the leaf-dappled horizon and the sky is a dazzling shade of crimson. Pillaged Kreser ale flows freely from mug to mug, and Captain Strophius stands at the helm, punch drunk and laughing, his arm strung over the shoulders of Iffy's best friend. As for Iphigenia, she's dancing. She's a titan of a woman, all muscle and power, but damn if she can't cut a rug. She takes Benny's hand and swings them in a wide arc, then holds out her arms for Lena and Levi. The twins jump, they each grab a bicep, and Iffy spins, twirling them through the air as they howl with laughter. The twins are six foot each and strong as pinwolves, but Iffy is a mountain, and she spins them like they weigh less than air. After all, Iffy has always been her crew's protector. She is as strong as ten pirates and fights as hard as them to boot. With Iffy on their side, Strophius's crew has never lost a single ship-to-ship -ship combat, not even against the Surge's navy. The fourth guide, the name of their ship, is infamous amongst Chongsin's verdant waves, and Iphigenia couldn't be happier. She is the guide's protector. She is the guide's dutiful knight. She would give her life to save the people she loves, and she would not die any other way. Only one person thinks differently for Iffy. As Iphigenia lowers the twins to the ground, she locks eyes with that person, up on the helm, shoulder to shoulder with Captain Strophius. The newly minted first mate, Iffy's best friend, has always told her that she wasn't just her strength, that she could fight for herself, too, that she should let them protect her once in a while. Iffy has always laughed them off, cracked a joke, changed the subject. But the words tug at something deep within her, something Iffy has never fully let herself surface. As Iffy turns and spins on the dance floor, she catches sight of something on the western horizon. Something small, but growing larger rapidly at an impossible rate. No one else sees it because the lookout is drunk on spectrogen and this thing is the color of the sky and Iffy is the tallest person here has the best and only view that could catch it before it hits. Iphigenia's eyes go wide. It is a fireball, hurtling toward the fourth guide, as red as blood with a smoking tail of black mist. Iffy asks, Iffy acts on instinct. She runs forward, braces her legs, throws out her arms, and boom! The fireball 
is the size of a small ship. It hits Iffy square on, smashes her through the central mast, through the starboard railing, and overboard. She feels pain. And then weightlessness. And then she hits the thrash, and everything goes black. In the blackness, Iphigenia is calm. She knows she is dying. Perhaps she is already dead. But she floats in this lifeless twilight with serenity because she died the way she always wanted to, saving the lives of those she loves. Then the anchor comes down and the hands hoist her up and there are compressions on her chest and she is gasping and sitting up and blearily looking around and there is a strange new ship about her with blurry faces she doesn't recognize and then she sees her savior. The man with the pale face. In time, she learns to call him the Baron, but right now he is a stranger and he does not ask for her name. Instead, he kneels down and she sees the horizon behind him thick with smoke and the smell of fire and the burning wild sea. The Baron speaks. He tells her her crew is gone. He says she is the lone survivor, the only one strong enough to weather such a terrible tragedy. He helps her to her feet and shows her the evidence. The burning leaves, the smoking trees, the oil, the ash, the flame. He tells her, somberly, that his crew is too late that hers was the only still-living body they fished from the wreckage. He gives her the name of his crew, of her saviors, and she holds it in her mouth like an anchor dragging her to the darkness under Eve's the Ashen. He tells her, You failed, child. You are not strong enough. He tells her, Come with me and I will show you how to become unstoppable. Your green world is weak. You must harness the thing that kills. You must fight fire with fire. And when Iffy looks away from the burning sea and at this pale-faced man, her heart is gone, is ash. She tells him she has no name anymore. And he says, I will name you. And he says, your name shall be Terror. Igni stands in the midst of this blazing banquet hall, wreathed in crimson fire. She narrows her blood red eyes at Sayre whose shoulders now are beginning to ripple with the same kind of fire, not blue like his usually is, but red, deep, rich, arterial red as you step back into your body, say here, and through gritted teeth, turning away from seeing that mote of fire still sparking in the palm of her hand, Igni snarls at you. What did you do again and sayer is going to run launch forward in a haymaker faint it and roundhouse kick her oh igni is forced to swing her hand away from sing who's still slumped at the base of this pillar to at first she thinks, brace against the haymaker, but then the kick comes up and smashes her against the side of her face. And this kick, your foot, your entire shin is wreathed in crimson flame. You hit the side of this mountain and impossibly the mountain moves. Igni staggers to the side, one foot, two feet, three feet, and hits the side of a wall, shaking her head like a prize fighter, taking a sucker punch to the temple, still upright, but a little dazed, shakes her head, <sighs> huffs, and you see smoke and fire come out of her mouth as she does. <sighs> I said, what did you 
do! And as she says do, she breathes fire at you, a gout of flame exploding from her mouth, smashing into you. How do you intercept this blow? I take it, baby. Oh. Sayer, oh. in fact, Sayer clicks the gauntlets. Now that his sleeves are on fire, his shoulder and kurta are on fire. He presses the buttons, activating his gauntlets and agitates the blade, the fire, coursing it around him and he just eats it. And he <sighs> looks up at Igni and says, I said again. And as he pulls up his hand, a his crescent blades can't be used. But out of the flame that Igni has tossed at him, he forms his own fiery crimson, uh, crescent oh. blades in his hands. And he says, you have taken a heavy blood price with my teacher. I will see that debt paid. And he will turn back to look over at Sing. <sighs> Sing is in your shadow that you are casting down at the base of this pillar. She struggles to a half stand, knelt on one knee, her longsword gripped hard against her fist. And she's looking up at you with wide shock on her face and pure unadulterated confusion. She is not really computing what's happening, what she's seeing. Her twin, Sayer, standing tall, wreathed in red fire, holding his own against this woman that even she couldn't fell. And then her eyes catch on the fire, wreathing your body, and the eyes go wide with just a spoke of anxiety. Sayer, stop! You're going to burn everything down! No. Do what we came here to do. Protect the Scions. It's my turn now. I can beat her. And he'll turn back looking down at Sing. I will beat her. It is inevitable. And he will hoist his crescent blades and holds it up to Igni. And he says this in a voice, Sing knows so well the voice of an omen speaker what he said what he says is not conjecture it is truth and he will go toe to toe fight fire with fire yeah if this fire explodes around you it explodes around igni as well she lets out a and smashes her fists together and fire wreaths around her hands like gauntlets as she charges forward. Every charge against the ground uh, cracks the flagstone. That's how hard she's running. And the two of you smash like titans colliding. Red flame against red flame. She's punching at you relentlessly. These prize fighter punches that you're just fucking tanking. You just take these hits like they're nothing. They're almost even muffled by gouts of flame exploding where they would be. Like this fire is shielding you. You barely feel it. How are you cutting against her? Again, and he eats another hit. Again, and he, hits, he eats another one. And as he keeps getting hit with every attack, he just keeps taunting her. Again, again, again. And right as he has an opening, he swivels his uh, gauntlets so that the wings spread out, spins, and aims an uppercut with his crescent blades. And as and if he if it does connect, he will mutter to himself, violence, 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 and shake it off as he continues going to town on Igni. This feeling of violence, of pure 
pure, unadulterated, fiery bloodthirst is coursing through you with every t uh, hit that you tank, with every slash you make with your fire blades, this feeling grows within you. It is nourishing you. It is empowering you. The fire is erupting off of your shoulders. You are bathed in it. You're not even thinking about Sing. You're not even thinking about the slumped body of Jinying Rafiq. You are not even thinking about the scions. You're just thinking about beating her, beating the shit out of her, winning violence, blood, fire, ash, oil. And I need you to roll to deliver that deadly uppercut. I think that's and gonna be test. iron or teeth. This is teeth and okay. I will say this is a hunt. A so you're hunt. hunting now. Okay, uh, make sure to add one because you have a fire uh, sickle with you, a fire blade. Yep. And I also want you to add on top of the regular d6 that you're rolling, three additional d6. Oh, lovely. So that's the, the, the fire and three d6. All right, that is for the audience at home, six d6 that I'm rolling right now. Go for it. Oh, very fun. So my highest is five. Uh, there are three, four fours and two ones. Okay. That is a conflict, success with a drawback, with a twist. So your fist with this blade against it punches up into Igni's chin and she, fly she flies up and hits the ceiling, the vaulted glass ceiling over a dozen, two dozen feet into the air. You punch her up like a reversing meteor and she smashes through the glass and she falls back down, hits the ground, shakes it like an earthquake and craters it. It's like a crater that's two, three, four, five feet deep as she slams onto the ground. And I think your hand is still up, like held up as she hits the ground next to you. And as you lower it, you just feel so strong. Say here, there's no other way around it. You are so powerful. This is the strongest you've ever felt in your life. You feel unstoppable. And the twist is there is absolutely no collateral damage. Aside from the cratered ceiling, the cratered floor, your fire doesn't spread. It doesn't hurt anyone else around you. It doesn't leap out and lash at Sing or a bossy or the unconscious Prin who has now fallen off of uh, Ignis's shoulder and hit the ground as well. There's no collateral damage. You feel in control, like Oregnus had promised you, had said it would help you do. Still a success with a drawback. I think the drawback is the Prin falling off of Ignis's shoulder. Wasn't you necessarily, it was her dropping them. Uh, mm -hmm. The Prin kind of vaults through the air, I think hits the ground with a kind of hard crack uh, and their unconscious body kind of rolls, rolls, rolls and then slumps against the pillar that you had just picked yourself off of. But now Igni is separated from her quarry. There's a moment Sing. as Sing, sing now. Sayer bellows and commands. And Sing? he... No, no, finish your thought. Sing is fully on her feet by now. She had taken a step toward the downed Igni with her blade drawn. But as you command for her to go after the Prin to help the Scion, she pauses, looks at you. I... We're, we're supposed to stop her together. Sayer looks back at Sing with eyes a deep crimson. And he just says, commands the mission. She's mine. And as he says that, he feels that control. The blades he forms now pulsing larger growing in his fists as he feels that control. And he points it over at Igni. And with such 
boy confidence, he says. Is this all the champion of Aragnus can muster? Is this the chosen? As you speak, your attention turned fully on Igni. Sing, standing there with her longsword by her side, opens her mouth to talk back at you, but then closes her mouth again and gives her head a small, uncertain, confused shake. She takes a few steps back and then more confidently turns and runs toward the prin to like help the prin up and check their vitals. And then we pan back to where you are, taunting Igni. For a second, Igni doesn't move. And you think maybe she's knocked out or perhaps even dead in the crater in front of you. And then she lets out a <coughs> <coughs> coughing, <coughs> pulls herself up to a, like a fully sitting stance and is breathing heavily. Her suit is torn, it is bloodied. Her, the entire side of her face is just caked with blood. Her eyes are full of hatred and violence towards you and something else. Yes, you can see it, Sayer. Something else is sparking in the depths of her eyes as she says to you, What, what have you done? Oh, Aragnus, what is the meaning of this? Why are you helping him? I don't understand. I am your Baron of Flame. Not him. Not him. And you recognize that glimmer in the pits of her eyes as envy. Enough! Staggering to his feet on the other side of the banquet hall is King Maswu Zahar. Zainan, close as you are to the royal, you have never seen him so clear-eyed, so focused, so present. His dark gaze is unclouded, his chin is held high, his legs are weak, but his stance is sturdy and his eyes are fixed on Igni and Sayer. King Maswu Zahar has bested his curse. I know of the darkness that controls you. It wormed its way into my brain, and it feasted upon my weakness. It promises strength. It promises power. But its promises are lies. All a regnus truly does is feed off the viciousness that already exists in all of our hearts. He amplifies it. He deepens it. He convinces us to choose darkness, to choose violence, to choose the easy way out. A reckness doesn't make you stronger. It makes you cruel. Do not confuse the two. Now that this kind gentleman has returned my ability to choose back to me, I will always choose true strength. The strength to be kind. The strength to admit when I need help. And the strength to not demolish my prey just because I can, but to protect the people I love. Leave my domain in peace, or leave your life in my talons! Igni snarls. Her crimson eyes dart between Seir and the king. And then her eyes dart around this banquet hall in its entirety, taking in the licking flames, the hungry fire spirits, spirits that the wild sailors and sky warriors of the Raya are starting to beat back thanks to Admiral Sahim Kurba's orders to fight against, to vanquish. Igni's gaze returns to you, Seir, and to the king. <sighs> Fool be the guest who overstays her welcome, but the bigger fool be the guest who doesn't leave her host with a gift. Igony closes her fingers into a fist as she stands and makes an acute pulling motion. King Maswu gasps. 
he staggers forward, stumbling over the stairs at the base of his dais, and an explosion of black oil pours from his eyes, his nose, his mouth, his ears, just as Prin Him Su Hyun had foreseen. Igni throws her fist in a circle above her head, and the oil levitates upward, like sapient mercury growing in volume until it is the size of five triforodons. It takes the shape of a massive oil black serpent, and it unhinges its jaw. As the last of the oil siphons from Masu's body, the king collapses onto his knees, gasping and convulsing. The oil snake lets out a wet, guttering hiss, and it lunges at what remains of the banquet party. Three tendrils explode from its form. One lances toward Sing, another lances toward Ying Ke, and another lances toward Admiral Sahim Kubra. At the exact same time, as fast as a spreading spark, Igni lunges in Prince Him Su Hyun's direction in an attempt to grab the Prin before she makes her escape. Seyern Zainan, what do you do? The moment that the oil started to leave Maswu, Zainan started to run towards him, but I think he thinks better of touching the oil as much as he's been handling that chitinous plate and uh, kind of lets it happen, but is moving to catch the king when he falls, but is stopped by the serpent and watches it like a hunter, aware that this is not just some magic floating in the air. And of course, the closest one is the admiral. So he's he runs, he reacts, it hurts but he does it. Okay. I'm gonna need you to roll to see how well you're able to protect the Admiral. So that's either gonna be teeth, I think, grace or iron. I'll take teeth. Okay. What skill are you using? Uh, I think he's gonna try and run over and using the, the blade that's now been following him, essentially kind of push it off and, and almost use it as a shield. Um, mm, like to deflect the tendril? Yeah. And so um, I'm thinking either brace or, um, yeah, probably brace, actually. Brace makes sense. Okay, roll yeah. and plus an advantage for using the knife. With different dice this time. <laughs> oh, and it paid off. That is two fives. Okay, that's a conflict. Success with a drawback. So the drawback is either going to be you're a little hurt or Admiral Sahim Kubra is a little hurt. It's always going to be Zainan. Zainan is always going to take the hit. <laughs> you're not doing well, but... Nope. Yes, okay. Uh, I need you to mark one on a track. As you yeah. deflect the tendril, you lunge forward, and the tendril, I think, uh, slashes to the side and grazes you across the body. Um, and I think the sword goes flying and actually mm. turns into the dagger for a minute as it leaves Zainan's radius. Mm. So what track are you marking? The blade. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the blade tanks that hit. Mm, ding, scatters to the side. Sayer, what do you do? Funny. I have a mm -hmm. bargain. Oh, a bargain for me? Please, a please state the terms. You. I have a trait called Ground Zero Overload. Okay. That I can mark to deal vault damage to all nearby foes or burn to increase the massive vault damage. Okay. I offer to burn it as okay. well as take whatever hit you want me to take. To protect Inge and the Prin, as Sayer looks over to Sing, and Sing's not running fast enough, and there is a brutality, a malevolence that eats up within him, and just screams that he has to do everything now. 
every single thing. And he will launch out a iridescent, almost oily colored electricity to contain the tendrils and eat it. Okay, notably, you did not say you were also trying to protect Sing. Is this I'm not, intentional? Not, I'm not going to try and protect Sing. I'm going to protect the Prin and Yuha. <laughs> okay. Ooh. I think you're going to have to burn to protect multiple people. And yep. I'm going to have to make you roll for it to see how successful yep. it is. Easy. No worries. Uh, so that is... I'm going to say I iron am... or teeth. Mm -hmm. I would humbly submit an iron and embrace. That okay, makes sense easy. to me. Go for it. Uh, I am. I'm going to have you add three yet again to your roll. You are empowered by your Regnus's blessing. <laughs> oh, this feels good. That's really it. That is for the audience at home. Uh, sixty-six. Yep. Oh, and look at that. A six. Three ones, two twos, and four. That is a triumph with a twist. The twist can be that you also save Sing if you would like. I'm seeing the the hold on. <laughs> I'm seeing the like the dot 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 above your head. Huh. I, I'm going to say I only bargained for two and I am overreaching, but I could maybe not make it as terrible an injury, maybe. Not that I save her, but maybe like mm. in the last moment before the worst of it kicks in, he steps in. And there is mm. a mm. ferocious mm. anger? Actually. Glare? Oh? Hold on, oh, hold on. Let, me I, I, Let me rewind. Let me rewind. Let me rewind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me rewind. Let me rewind. Um, okay. What if... What if the twist that I can offer you... Is if you, if you want. If you want. There can be, uh, after you use this power, a physical manifestation on your body uh, of your connection to this force that is granting you power. Give me that snake tattoo, Connie. <laughs> the snake it. tattoo! Yes, into it. Okay, so, Sayer. Oil black electricity explodes out of your body and spider webs in every direction as you see those tendrils shooting toward Yinghe and shooting toward uh, Sing. You also see Igni uh, diving in the unconscious prince direction. The electricity, this oil electricity, hits Igni straight on and it like punches her to a wall. She cracks against it and falls to the ground. And the other spidering tendrils of electricity hit that other shooting jet of pure black void energy uh, and shatters it in midair right before it hits Yinghe. And as it shatters, it falls to the ground like black rain and oil just spatters uselessly and harmlessly in a cascade around him. At the last moment, as Sing is running toward the limp body of the Prin, it's like she feels, she senses the tendril coming toward her. She lifts up her pink longsword and ding, like the tendril hits the side of the blade. She staggers a little bit. And I think the force of it causes her to uh, stumble across the hall, hit the ground and hit another wall. And I think dust plumes around her. We're unable to see how intense the injury is quite yet. But the print is there, Igni is down, Sing is down, Yinghe is safe as it seems, but that oil serpent is still here. It's still uh, towering over the entire banquet hall, growling and hissing with this oil slick gurgling noise at the back of its throat, sloughing uh, thick black liquid onto the ground around it. Everyone in the space is 
freaking out. They are panicking. They're screaming now and trying to flee from this new central monstrosity uh, taking over uh, all of the violence and the attention inside this banquet hall. So we're turning over now to Zynan as you have successfully deflected this blow from the Admiral. Now there's this massive oil serpent in front of you. What do you do? Zynan looks up fully terrified. We're back in the nightmare. And even though it's smaller, it roils behind his eyes and he can just see it. And he is powerless. He doesn't know what he can even do. At least in the nightmare, he had his rifle and here he has nothing anymore. So he is going to reach out and call the dust back to him. And through the crowd, the small claw-like knife comes spinning and lands in his hand and it explodes into dust again. And he is gonna throw it. He is going to throw the knife up into the serpent. Not today. Um, and he is just unsure of what wielding this even means, what it even is following, but he is holding his Ema's knife and she taught him what to do. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna need you to roll for that, I think, to see how successful you are standing there with your knife to defend and protect in this moment. Uh, I'm sorry, did I, did I miss something? Okay, cool. Uh, so that is going to be, I think the edge that makes sense here is either iron, sh char, no, maybe iron, grace, or teeth. I have a, a weird pitch for you because okay, he's please. using something that he doesn't fully understand and this blade is a effect of the wild sea. So I'd like to pitch tides. Ooh, I'm into that. Yes, let's go with tides. And what skill are you bringing to the hunt here? Hunt, it's Isha's knife. We hunt today. Go for it. Yes, add an advantage for that because you're using the knife as well. Two fives. Okay, that is a conflict with a twist. Uh, that is mostly a success with a drawback. What does it look like, the successful part, right? As you're wielding this knife that you know so well. He looks it over and remembering what it was like to pass through the crowd and feeling that adrenaline still pumping in him. He actually throws it up and it begins to just like a bird spin in the air and the dust begins to create this deflection layer of stopping the oil from falling on the crowd. And um, even though it is dust mingling with ash, it is enough. Mm, yeah. The dust mingles with this ash, but it does create that layer to protect the crowd from the fallout of this oil around you. You're basically forming like a safe dome around this area that you are standing in around the civilians, keeping them shielded from this inevitable clash that's about to happen here. Uh, that is a successful part. I think the drawback is it takes you a lot of uh, focus. I think to sustain this. This is the first time you're using this knife in full true combat and you're stretching its abilities and your connection to it a little bit to the limit. So yet again, I'm gonna ask you to mark one on a track as you try to keep this momentum sustained. I think, oh, I think it's gotta be the blade again, which is the third track. Yeah. Okay, yep. Is that the last oh, box you have for it? That's the last box. Yep. Okay. Oh. What, what does it look like as you mark that final track and you're kind of really on like the final edge of your connection to this knife for now? As it spins up there and he watches it, the dust begins to fall and he is watching it and watching it. And he's standing under a cloud of dust watching this blade that he has held in every dark moment in his life. And he suddenly loses the will that is required 
to keep it going like that. The faith that he just gained from seeing Maswu stand against a curse. And he's tired. And the blade begins to falter. Mm, yeah, I think as the dust fans out from this blade, it's like the blade is spending its dust for it to keep up, right? So we're seeing like this long length of vicious dust starting to like shorten and shorten and shorten from like this, the, the length of like the sword down to the dagger. And it's almost like it's whittling itself away to keep the protection going. The twist that you get is through this curtain of dust that's falling, that's doming around you, you see that figure still with the red veil on its face in the center of the dance floor. It hasn't moved this person since Igni arrived, burst through the doors and demanded that Abbasi Zahar was coming with her. This person hasn't moved. In the midst of the chaos, they have just simply stood there and watched as they had been told to do to just get back. And even through the veil, even though their back is turned to you, the twist, Zainan, is that you recognize her. That's Ying He. From the other plane, from the moon-kissed temple. What the hell are they doing here? And now we cut to Sayer. Igni, as far as you're concerned, is out of commission for now. Sing, as far as you're concerned, out of commission for now. The print is there, safe unbothered by Igni. Now this massive, huge, oil black serpent is menacing this entire banquet hall. It is that last thing you need to take care of before everyone is truly safe. You feel your blood burning in your veins. You feel fire rolling off of your skin, off of your hair, no, off of your soul. You feel the viciousness rising inside you and you look at this massive serpent and you know, you just know, Sayer, you could take that thing out. What do you do? You are muted. One day, one day, I will recognize the red light. Sayer looks up and he feels this pull from his chest, now colored, slick, and iridescent, this tattoo of his. And from the dark moon tattoo, a serpent slithers out, forming up his neck, and sits around him like a dangled, untied tie. It just sits there, toying, tempting, and as Seir forms these crescent blade in his hands, he remembers them. Everything he has ever been trained for has come down to this. The final blade and the pulse. That is the hunter's ultimate goal. And Seir lowers down the rumble from his chest moves the very ground and he will leap upwards and just like a cassowary ends the pulse of its prey he will plunge the crescent blade or attempt to plunge the crescent blade into this serpent's chest mm. Sayer, there's this moment as you turn to face the oil serpent and you start to like take a step forward, a step forward, right? Starting to run into that jump that we see the other protectors of the Raya coming forward at the base of this oil serpent, also dealing damage to it as much as they can, helping you, teeing you up for the final blow. We see a bossy diving in circles around this thing, swiping out with the claws that have popped out from her winged gauntlets, crying out loud, tears pouring from her eyes, gashing at the oil hide of this serpent. We see King Zumarud and Queen Amin al Yakut standing at the sides, barking orders, pointing at the serpent as sky warriors and wild sailors alike charge forward with improvised weapons and attack the base of this serpent. And we even see Prim Him Su Hyun 
uh, rousing a little bit to consciousness, pulling themselves up from the base of the pillar, their washed out black eyes suddenly going wide, coming into focus as they see the serpent, as they see you, say you're lunging yourself into the air. And under their breath, we hear the prince say, the oil curse, the curse that killed my father. And then, Sayer, you come down and BAM! Your blade hooks into the center of the serpent's chest. And I need you to roll with another plus 3d6 to try to kill this thing. So that's gonna be teeth, I think. Plus teeth break hunt. or hack. Uh, could I offer a Sorry, hunt? break. I... Hunt! Yes, hunt works as well. Absolutely. This is the conclusion, this is the conclusion of the hunt. And in this moment, as he plunges it in, we'll roll. That's 5d6. There it is. Two sixes, a one, two, and a four. That is a triumph with a twist. As your blade comes down, you explode in flame. Your body is wreathed in it. And you, you slice this thing from uh, jaw to navel. And you hit the ground. And you ignite this thing in a pure pillar of fire. It goes up and it burns. But again, nothing else burns. The fire is completely controlled. It is completely contained to the oil curse and to you. And you watch, I think as you land, you look up, you watch as this thing just burns. The oil burns and it burns and it burns and it's thrashing and it's wailing and it's hissing and it's growling and then it hits the ground and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the fire burns it down, 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 down until there's nothing left but a small tiny licking moat of flame and then that is gone as well. The oil is gone eaten up by the fire and the fire is gone having eaten the last of the oil. Sayer looks moment. upon it. Sayer looks upon it, unmoved, unshaken. The glimmer in his eyes, fiery, his eyes fully crimson. And all he says is, And you will be next. There's a moment of silence, a brief, rather violent lack of noise punctuated only by the final guttering dregs of various flames throughout this banquet hall. And then the people of the Raya surge forward. They crowd around their royals, their loved ones, their friends, their colleagues. They hold each other tight and they start to weep. Other people stagger immediately toward the rubble, intent on excavating the last of the injured, the broken, perhaps even a couple of dead. Sayer, you are immediately surrounded for once in your life by grateful, adoring faces. So many Ryans are now pressing themselves up against you, thanking you. They are grabbing at your hands to hold them and shake them. They're kissing at your fingers. They're pressing their foreheads against your shoulder. And over and over and over again, you hear the same words repeated. Thank you. You're a hero. Thank you. Off to the side, in the corner of your eye behind you, you see Sing, pulling herself up to a stand, bloodied, her sword arm bruised and gashed. It looked like maybe she didn't fully deflect the tendril after all. There's a bloody wound against her shoulder, pulling herself up to a stand, but less so physically injured, alone, forgotten for once in her life. There is a look of genuine confusion confusion and shock and a lack of understanding on Sing's face as she watches her twin take the shine. Next to her, where Igni had been crumpled, the last of the dust washes away and we see just an empty space. She must have fled when the chaos descended. Sayer Zainan, how are you responding to this? Zainan is down on the dance floor with all the rubble and ruin and I think deflects anyone who comes to thank him and keeps digging and looking in the rubble trying to rescue people and he is delirious 
but cannot stop. Hmm. As I think you were just immediately, intently, almost like manically, mm-hmm. start reaching toward the rubble and start just like shoving it with your bare hands, like using your muscle to just like wrench pieces of crumbled cement and brick up and off of the floor. You feel two hands rest on your back as the last of the dust cascades around you. And I think that dusty boot knife vanishes. You know, it's not fully gone. You can still feel its connection to you somewhere inside your soul, but it's going to take a little bit of repair and recovery to bring it back to the forefront of your ability now, now that the track is fully marked. Those two hands on your back and then a third one on the small of your waist as Admiral Kubra approaches you with Lady Okami on your other side. The Admiral looking at you insistently with concern on their face. Zainan. Zainan, you did well. We gotta make sure everyone's out of here. Zainan, you need to sit down and rest. I have my wild sailors do most of the excavating. You need to take a breather. Wild sailors. McCrew. That's right. Uh, I gotta... Where are they? And he starts to look around for the rest of Nova. Mm. Yeah, Zaiden, as you turn your exhausted gaze around this banquet hall, we land on Sayer. How are you taking in this adulation? Poorly. Extremely poorly. Whatever force kept Sayer upright, unwounded, fades it slips out of him like a for- forced exhale and he crumples for a moment his he blinks and his bright blue eyes have returned the oil slicked tattoo is back to its black matte form and he kind of just stumbles and raises his his ha- hands up in confusion uh, i i'm i'm sorry i'm sorry i Please, I there's there's many that need, and his eyes will fall to look for his team where they are, as well as where Lieutenant Rafik is. Is mm. are they? Yeah, yeah. As you look around, you see that the northern gates has a contingent of wild sailors, and they are kind of pulling Rafik in very gently upon a improvised stretcher and gently setting her down and you can see them like checking her vitals and then nodding to each other there's kind of like a slump of relief by the wild sailors tending to her and we see her her chest rising and falling very weakly but it's still there it seemed like she was simply gravely wounded instead of mortally injured as she's there just on the stretcher (sighs) with her wild sailors around her and reality finally hits sayer gravity of everything and he looks around and he's panicked now sense finally filling his mind sing sing mira ying he yeah as you're looking around thinking about your twin about lumira ying he and then ying is there sayer he is right there in the crowd of dozens of people praising you at the very front of it she's pushing through these people to greet you and their face is still covered by that crimson veil they have not let it slide from their head Uh, sayer i wasn't sure if i should help you or stay back because you said not to draw attention and to go home but i thought maybe i should stay to see what happened but you looked like you were in trouble and then you weren't and and then yinke cuts themselves off her glittering silver eyes travel upward above your head and slightly behind you and then an expression of awe blooms on his face like a full moon awe wonder familiarity and almost love do you turn around sayer yeah i do and now we follow ying he's eyes and your own The oracle hums nearby, Sayer, and is beaming a full-body holographic projection of hand Artemis into the middle of this banquet hall. Agent Sayer, would you care to explain why you've broken code 31 section B of Fate's handbook, jeopardizing your strike team's mission? 
your place as an agent of trans, and the fabric of the multiverse itself. Before you can respond, Artemis tips her palm outward, upward, and then down. And Ying He vanishes, like they are pulled through the floor into their own shadow and back poof, to their own realm. So that the only thing that remains of him is, of course, that red veil that exists from this place. Artemis tips her head. She gestures outward at the crowd gathered around in this ashen dust. Speak freely. All they see is you communing with one of the twin spirits of this world's moons. We will not be interrupted and you have lots of explaining to do, Agent. And Sayer's proud facade crumbles. He is returned again to that young man in Artemis's office who has his face down to not look Artemis in the eye but hears that reprimand from before and keeps the gaze. And sir, Whatever punishment you wish to dole out upon Ying He, let it fall upon me. It is not their folly that unraveled the multiverse. It is I. The responsibility is mine. I'm well aware of whose responsibility it is. Ying He has not been harmed. They have simply been returned to their own plane. He should have never come here to begin with. Who you choose to share your secrets with is not a concern of mine, she says very carefully. But what you choose to do with your mission and with the very fabric of reality itself is, do you hear me? Loud and clear hand. Good. We shall discuss any further reprimands upon your return to the Syndicate. For now, she turns, looking upon the destruction, upon the victory. They cross their arms, the holograph kind of wavering. Perhaps there is a hunter in you after all. Perhaps you've already surpassed my challenge. Nova needs you, Sayer. At your best. Keep going. You've done very well today. Sayer's speechless. That's the closest to a well done he would could ever hear from Artemis and all he does is place his fists upon his chest and I will not rest agent thank you and Artemis turns but before she leaves Artemis's distressingly radiant eyes find yours Zainan The hologram is stumbling <laughs> towards where this conversation is happening. Sign in. Artemis meets you halfway, I think. The hologram moves toward you and she rests a steady, broad hand on your shoulder. But when it touches you, there's no weight there. But the presence of it is heavy and it looms bigger than any mountain, a collapsed star, a raptor's talon. And she does something she's never done before. They lean down and they whisper in your ear. And even when the words come, no breath stirs the hairs around your neck. She is just a hologram after all. She would be proud, agent. Well done. 
Thynan doesn't have any words for all the times that this has been what drives him every day. He just nods. Their words are felt, and he nods, but his eyes are glassy and tired. Like saying it was worse than any injury he received today. Artemis's hologram presses something into your hands. The weight of that suddenly is very real when the object connects, and it's the hilt of a boot knife. Thanks. Do you want to live, Agent? <laughs> you know the answer. She smiles, leans back up to her full height. Trust in her will. Trust in her will. And Artemis vanishes. As Artemis goes, you get a full view of this banquet hall now. It is in ruins. It is covered in oil. The bard's stage is completely burned to ash. A couple of smoldering flames still flicker that sky warriors very dutifully attend to with thick blankets and hoses spurting cold water now. But mostly there's just rubble. Just rubble and ash. In the center of this banquet hall, we see Maswu, Amun, Zumarud, and Abasi come together in a big, crushing group hug. All of them are crying, all of them are holding each other as tightly as lifelines. And after what feels like a lifetime, King Maswu pulls away, wiping at his eyes with the back of his hand. Amun, Zumarud. Abasi, I am so sorry I wasn't strong enough to fight off the curse I should have admitted when I needed help when the curse was still young inside my soul. I tried to hide it for so long. I tried to stave it off by myself, but I was ashamed, and I let all of you down. I let the Raya down. I'm so sorry. Amin steps forward with her back tight and straight. Maswu, the people of the Raya will let us know if they are disappointed in their king, and we will answer to them with our heads held high. But in my eyes, and in my heart, I am nothing but happy to see my husband again. Zumarud also steps forward, hands outstretched, palms turned skyward. You are the shining glow petal of my heart, Maswu. You know that. Always. And Abasi just gives her dad a big, crushing bear hug. I'm just happy to have my father back. Maswu hugs his family close to him once more. And then he grimaces. Sharply, he grabs at the center of his chest, growling gah, in pain. And his family immediately presses in around him, concerned, Father? What's wrong? It's... It's the curse. It's... It's damaged something on the way out. My blood. My soul. As Maswu lowers to one knee in pain, Sing comes out of the dust, the ash approaching both you, Sayer, and you. Zainan. Though she's clutching one of her injured, punctured shoulders, she looks like she's not even concerned about her physical health. Instead, she looks insistent and worried for something beyond herself. Zainan. Sayer. Hey. Have either of you seen Lumira? I was just wondering no. that. I went looking for her just now. Everywhere. All four directions. All four courtyards. Even the hanging gardens outside. I can't find her. Lumi's gone. 
And we're going to end the session there. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in to episode 17 and 18 of Arc 1 of the Chaos Protocol. I have been your game master and creative producer, Connie Chung. My pronouns are they, he and she. You can find me across the internet at by Connie Chung. That's B-Y-C-O-N-I-C-H-A-N-G on TikTok. TikTok, TikTok, and Twitter. I'm going to pass things over to Mr. Love Wins. Hello, everybody. My name is Valiant Love and Fire Shall Win Dorian. I use he and his pronouns. You can find me all around the internet at Valiant Dorian or at Otso Spirit Bear. Please enjoy that lovely treasure hunt I just set you on. And tonight I had the distinct pleasure of playing Seir, who's winning now, who uses he they pronouns i'm gonna pass it over to the incredible kai oh my gosh uh hi guys i'm kai uh you can find me everywhere as estelle of imladris and tonight i got to play a father zine and ash go on connie take us home it's a me connie taking us home uh so we are gonna be back next week Sam's gonna be back. What the hell is Lumira up to? We'll find out next week, Saturday. That is September 9th at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, as usual, right here, right now, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Twitch.tv slash Translator RPG for the Chaos Protocol. We're gonna be raiding someone really awesome right now, no doubt. C's gonna be taking us to that raid. Let's give a big thank you to C for playing Artemis as well, a special Artemis appearance. You can uh, follow C on C Plays RPG on Twitter and uh, also here on Twitch. And yeah, we're going to go raid someone really awesome. Use the raid message in chat. See you next week. Thank you to everyone who's donated to our crowdfunding so far. I'm really optimistic we're going to hit 5K before uh, Big Bad Con. And thank you all so much for tuning in. See you next week. Bijou. Bijou.